Hi everybody, I'm Pete Woodward and we're continuing our study of the Gospel of Mark as put together by our, uh, our Lifelight um, lesson material. This is uh, Lesson 7 and they gave us a boatload of chapters to cover today so I think we'll just get right into uh, looking at the chapters and just hit some of the important high points of the things that are in your lesson for this week. We start in Mark chapter 11. Uh, I hope I said Mark a minute ago. Uh, Mark chapter 11, which really marks the beginning of Holy Week. Uh, and the event is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We have this neat little vignette about Jesus sending his disciples to go and uh, get a colt um, that's tied someplace. Um, and uh, indicates his omniscience uh, <laughs> to know that uh, there might be some pushback about borrowing this colt, but um, Jesus tells his disciples what to say, and they say it, and the colt is suddenly on loan and available, and uh, we have a clear message here that they brought the colt back because they said they would, and people celebrated Jesus' entry into Jerusalem with cloaks and branches. But I think the most important thing here is what they said. What they said was, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means save now or save us now. It's, a, it's an imperative. It's like they're saying, save us, O blessed one who comes in the name of the Lord. And then again, they say, Hosanna in the highest, and I think they're, they're saying, save us for a heavenly habitation, the highest um, location they can possibly imagine. And, uh, excuse me just a minute, I get a phone call on the computer, there it is, I'll have to call that back. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, from uh, that particular event, Jesus uh, spends the night in Bethany and the next day, they're on their way back into Jerusalem. Jesus curses a fig tree uh, because it had no fruit on it. it would, um, I don't know if, if you've ever lived in a Mediterranean climate. Uh, a fig tree, a fig tree almost always has figs on it. It almost always has fruit. So for Jesus to encounter this fig tree without any fruit on it, there's something wrong with this tree. And... Uh, so um, he says, nobody's going to eat of this tree ever again. And the next day, of course, we'll see that uh, the tree ha had, had withered away. I think it's interesting, the placement of this uh, little uh, event right before Jesus cleanses the temple, because it's like the cursing of the fig tree is a parable, uh, very much similar to what's going on in the temple. Uh, the work that's being done in the temple is fruitless work. It was a temple that was, and a location that was designed to uh, draw the nations um, into knowledge of and hopefully relationship with the Almighty God. That's not what happened. It became, a, as Jesus says, a den of robbers. Uh, the tree and the temple, uh, fruitless. And um, I think that's what's going on here for our understanding, a, a kind of a, a faithlessness, because when Jesus starts to talk about the, the tree as it's withered, as his disciples notice it, he says, have faith in God. Uh, he uses it as, it as uh, an opportunity to teach his disciples about the importance of faith with respect to their fruitfulness. Uh, the Jewish leaders had decided that uh, their, their progress in the kingdom, <laughs> uh, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, was by their own work, by their own devices of, in this case, making money. Uh, and uh, the focus had turned completely around so that it was on them and not on God. So I, I think that's maybe the at least one important lesson that comes through underneath that. Um, 
Chapter 11 ends with uh, Jesus' authority being challenged. He was walking in the temple, it says, the chief priests and scribes and elders came to him saying, by what authority are you doing these things? I'm sure it, the antecedent of that is back to him cleansing the temple as though he had authority to do that. Uh, and from where does he get it? He says, well, I'll answer your question if you'll answer one for me. And he brings up John the Baptist, you know, uh, the, the, the comment is, uh, what was, where was John's baptism from? Was it from uh, heaven or from man? Of course, this stumps the, uh, the religious leaders, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, because uh, they can't answer it. Um, if they say from John, then they have to admit, as Jesus points out, we didn't pay attention uh, to God. <laughs> And the message John the Baptist was giving, most importantly, well, not just the forgiveness of sins and baptism, but the focus, the pointing at Jesus as the Messiah. And if they say it's from man, all the other people get mad at them because, well, they thought that John the Baptist was sent from God, and so they're stuck. What I think is interesting is that Jesus pretty much answers their question, nonetheless, because he says, was the baptism from heaven or from man? What he's really saying, I think, is that my authority is from heaven. And he's using an example of something else that's going on, a big example, because John the Baptist's Im impact was big, it was huge. Uh, they don't get it, and he says, then we're done talking. Then uh, Jesus has uh, a parable here. Uh, parabolic uh, language, certainly, about uh, a vineyard. You read it. Uh, the, uh, the upshot is the parable points directly at uh, Jesus being crucified on the, the cross in Jerusalem at the end of this week. And um, it's, a, it's a parable that's describing really rather specifically um, what's going to happen. <coughs> He's making yet another prediction of his death. And the other interesting thing is uh, that when the um, ne'er-do-wells uh, throw the owner of the vineyard out, uh, they, they take him, kill him, throw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. And this is a hint, if not a direct uh, comment, of uh, the kingdom being opened to um, all believers, Jews and Gentiles. So this is kind of a, a um, premonition of the ministry that Jesus calls his disciples to do at Pentecost. Um, then uh, we have... Uh, <laughs> In chapter 12 here, starting at verse 13, a kind of a, a stump the chump uh, series of events. Uh, they're coming to Jesus, trying to stump him with various questions. The first one is, do we pay taxes to Caesar? And he his comment is just so apt, you know, render to Caesar. Uh, what is Caesar's render to God? What is God's? Because we carry the likeness and inscription were made in God's image. We, what is our life but to offer it back to God? And uh, that stumped, really, stumped the chumps. They were trying to stump Jesus, but Jesus stumps the chumps. The chumps are the religious leaders. Uh, then they, the Sadducees come along and ask about um, the resurrection. Uh, it right away indicates... Um, the Sadducees said there is no resurrection. Uh, what's underneath that is that they were so politically involved with the people, they didn't want the people uh, following anyone else but their own leadership because they were afraid that people would, would uh, invest their time and energy in faithfully following God and his word who points out that, yes, there is life after death. And uh, they didn't want this ethereal, 
forward-looking, eternal perspective in God's people. They wanted a social and um, temporal perspective so that they could wield their power uh, for the sake of, well, their own lining their own pockets, perhaps, but also having sway with the Roman government. So that was their approach, and that's what's underneath that statement about not believing in the resurrection. Uh, Jesus points them back, <laughs> really, to, uh, to Genesis and uh, the reality of... Um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that uh, God is the God of generations that in present tense are uh, alive and well in their heavenly home. And so uh, this, uh, this afterlife, this uh, hope of resurrection is, is made quite clear by Jesus, I think, in uh, this particular little vignette. It's a little bit difficult to, to parse out there, but that's that's my takeaway at least for that. And then someone else comes and tries to stump him, I think, with the uh, uh, which commandment is the most important of all. And of course, he says, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And so uh, the guy that's that's challenging him, uh, pretty much comes back and agrees and then says something really interesting. He says, God is uh, much more interested in love of God and one's neighbor than in whole burnt offerings and sacrifice. In other words, there's, uh, in the religious practice of that day, there was so much time and energy invested in the outward show of faithfulness without any heart being underneath of it. And the outward show, all of the sacrifice, all of the offerings, you know, was an opportunity to uh, demonstrate wealth, uh, which is uh, soundly contrasted by the widow giving her two last coins at the end of this particular chapter and, and her faithfulness. Uh, and that contrast alone shows us what Jesus says to this guy. He says, you are not far from the kingdom of God because he got it. He said sacrifice comes first and foremost from love of God and love of one's neighbor. You know, there's a kind of a cross thing going on there. And uh, that relationship far more important than any outward demonstration that we could make of of gifts. Um, God doesn't need our money. <laughs> you know, the cattle on a thousand hills are his. Uh, he's interested in our hearts and that our hearts are dedicated. So um, again, a, a, a learning lesson and a, a stumper for uh, those who were listening. And then Jesus makes a, a one more stump, the chump challenge back on uh, these guys. Um, relative to David, uh, that uh, the Christ is the son of David, and yet David in his Psalms pretty much indicates that his son is really his Lord. Uh, you could retranslate uh, the quote from Psalms where it says, the Lord said to my Lord, you could say, God said to Jesus, sit at my right hand. And David himself calling Jesus Lord. How is he his son? And so he's trying to turn upside down their, um, their devotion to either David or any other of the patriarchs preceding as opposed to the one true God who is standing there in front of them. And uh, Jesus makes another warning about being aware of the scribes who walk around in long robes. It's the, it's the hypocrisy uh, because um, they devour widows. They use up 
people's wealth for their own aggrandizement, which is again another interesting reason for the widow's offering that uh, Jesus highlights to his disciples. He says, I'll tell you the truth, this widow put more uh, than all those who contributed into the offering box. And he's obviously talking about a, a percentage giving. She gave 100%. She gave everything that she had. And we have to believe after reading all of God's promises that he didn't abandon her but took very good care of her because of her generosity, because of her commitment to giving back to God and to the ministry, the true ministry of showing people uh, the truth of God and his salvation to the world. She was invested in that. Well, chapter 13 is um, pretty much devoted to uh, Jesus talking about the end times, both his end <laughs> and the end of the, the um, Jewish worship as they knew it, and then the end of time. And what this does is it brings up for us a theological construct that, uh, that we study where we see God's word uh, teaching us uh, the now and the not yet. Um, and so we hear Jesus talking about things that are going to happen momentarily uh, and or very soon in the future, the destruction of the temple, for example, or the... Uh, uh, the abomination of desolation standing uh, where he ought not to be. Uh, these are little pictures that Jesus is teasing out there of things that are going to happen to the temple, um, you know, where he says not one stone will be left, the stones will be thrown down. Those are, those are soon and coming uh, prophecies. Uh, they, they, they did come true. We can look and say, oh yeah, we know that that happened. And yet, Jesus also uh, points out some things that we would have to look at and say, he's talking about when he comes again. He's coming again, um, and uh, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation uh, foremost tease out a lot of these ideas, but the Gospels do too. And Jesus speaking very specifically about his return is saying, I'm going to come back again. Not a number of times. I, I know we get inundated, particularly this time of year, uh, with a lot of radio preachers and perhaps television preachers talking about the rapture and that, you know, all the believers are going to be somehow sucked out of the world and all that's left is going to be all the unbelievers and they're going to be looking around blinking and wondering what happened to everybody and oh i don't know there have been books written it's it's interesting i'm going to say this <laughs> it's interesting fiction because we don't find any <laughs> biblical support for that rap rapture kind of uh, evacuation of God's people from the earth. Quite the opposite, and, and this Mark chapter 13 is, is pretty clear. Jesus is going to return, be watchful and waiting for his return, and meanwhile, don't be surprised at the trials and tribulations that come your way. Uh, and so I know there's a big controversy over all of that uh, back and forth, uh, if you have more questions, we can uh, delve more into this whole area, and I'm hoping your lesson has given, given you some uh, good instruction around this whole area of the end times. But in the, in the final analysis, <laughs> Jesus' words are, uh, well, a couple of them are, are really important for us. Uh, verse uh, 20 uh, of chapter 13 and if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Uh, that's good news. He's watching out for us. He's taking care of us. He's not going to let any evil befall us. He, he, 
he in his baptism, he said, in your baptism, he says, I am with you always. And his commitment, his promise to watch over us and keep us is only too direct and too precious. Hang on to that. And then in verse 32, concerning the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And then he says, be on your guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. And then he says that again in verse 36, lest he comes suddenly and find you asleep, and what I say to you, I say to all, <laughs> that's the not yet, <laughs> stay awake. In other words, keep watchful. Uh, maintain your faith. Do everything you can to demonstrate yourself to the Lord as loving him with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor with that same uh, love. Well, chapter 14, uh, we're trying to move along here. Chapter 14, we see uh, now a, a plot is emerging to um, arrest Jesus by stealth, you know, sneak up on him and then kill him. But not during the feast, lest there be an uproar. Well, Jesus chooses the time of his arrest and death doesn't he? Uh, and, and this uh, little comment is not unlike what we saw in chapter 11, verse 18, where uh, already then they're conspiring to destroy, uh, destroy Jesus. Um, I want to uh, also mention uh, just a little bit here where uh, Jesus is anointed at Bethany. It's like, it's like the the uh, the king uh, being anointed for his kingly role. Uh, king David being anointed uh, as king. Here Jesus is anointed. Although where does his where does his crown come? But on the cross, his kingship, uh, his glory, his authority. Uh, comes to a culminating point on the cross. Um, and uh, the gospel says, uh, whenever the story is told, this woman who anointed me will be remembered. Well, that just happened, didn't it? Uh, Judas betrays Jesus. Uh, and then we step into uh, the Passover, where Jesus on omniscience, <laughs> again, is noticed that uh, he sends his disciples uh, to some place, um, uh, find a man carrying a jar of water. He'll meet you and say, I got it all prepared. That's where I want to have the Passover. The disciples go, and sure enough, they find it just like that. Uh, Jesus indicates that Judas is going to betray him, tells who it is. And then he institutes the Lord's Supper. Uh, he took bread after blessing it, broke it, gave it to them, and said, take this is my body. Is means is. So that's our uh, understanding of Holy Communion that Jesus is giving us very truly, in a very real sense, his body and blood in Holy Communion. Uh, but look, it's, it's taking place at a Passover commemoration. Um, he takes the, the, the cup and giving thanks, he gave to them, and they all drank of it. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. The covenant goes back to God's promise to save his people from Egyptian slavery, where the blood of the lamb was put on the lintels or of the doorpost of people's houses, and the angel of death flies over, and only the firstborn in the land who didn't have the instructions, who weren't God's people, who didn't put the blood of the Lamb on their doorposts, are slain. And yet, what are we about to see? But Jesus' blood, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, God's wrath is poured out on the firstborn of all creation, on his own Son, and in both cases, in the Old Testament, Passover, and here on the cross, the blood of the covenant <laughs> sets God's people free from slavery. 
It was Egyptian slavery in the Old Testament. It's slavery to sin and death in the New Testament. Jesus foretells Peter's denial, this famous statement uh, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Uh, I'm sure you've heard that before. Then we see Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, I, I, I wanted to comment here at chapter uh, 14, verse 36. Abba, Father, all things are possible, Jesus prays. All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And it, and it took me, in my mind, back to chapter 11, verse 24, uh, where Jesus is instructing his disciples, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. What, is Jesus contradicting himself here? Uh, because he's, he's asking, and, and why, doesn't, why doesn't he get what he asked? If anybody was faithful, it's Jesus. You know, he's asking in faith. I think what we have is a very wonderful uh, living out of what prayer before the Father looks like. Look, he knows what we need. He knows his will for our lives. He calls upon us to pray. Uh, but what prayer does for us is puts us in touch with what God really does want, both for us and for his world. And it starts to shape our prayer, not selfishly, but with the world and salvation clearly in mind. And that's why Jesus says, yet not what I will, but what you will. In other words, he's wholly dedicated to accomplishing what God has sent him to do. The disciples go to sleep, um, and the betrayer comes, and it's Judas. Um, he says, uh, the one I kiss will be the man, sees him, and when he came, he went up at once, and he says, Rabbi, and he kissed Jesus. Uh, this is really interesting to read in other um, Gospels, in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, for example. And uh, we'll just close here. Uh, Jesus says, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Uh, day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching. You didn't seize me then, but let the scripture be fulfilled. You can look up Psalm 69, verse 9, and Psalm 41, verse 9, to uh, get very direct um Fulfillment of prophecy here. Again, Psalm 69, 9, and Psalm 41, 9. And uh, this little vignette, a young man followed. He had just a linen cloth on. They seized him. It, it's like they grabbed him, and they grabbed him by the cloak, and he was able to wriggle out of it, and he ran away naked. Uh, some suggest that this is probably the writer of this gospel, probably Mark because uh, it, it sounds pretty much like a first-hand account that only one person would know about. And uh, pretty bold of him to, to put it in the lesson. Okay, that's, that's a long stretch, a long section. Um, but uh, we pray God's blessings upon your study. The Lord be with you.